There are pilots who made millions smuggling and then walked away from the danger and the risk. Some invested their payoffs in legitimate businesses and real estate. Others blew it on expensive toys and partying. We'll never know how many got away with it, because most of those pilots have kept their secrets to themselves. But there are some who have shared their stories for all to see. Over the next two episodes, you'll hear how Billy Deagle of Florida made his millions and then lost them. How more than once, he was lucky to survive the kind of flights that others didn't. And how when everything came crashing down, Billy Deagle went to prison for life. And you'll hear how the power of mercy and forgiveness can create a new life. Stay tuned for this episode of Fly By Night. Billy Deagle grew up on a cattle farm in North Florida. The son of hardworking parents, well aware that his ambitions as a child were limited to becoming a cowboy, or in more formal terms, a cattleman. Billy and his older brother Bob were like two sides of a coin. Bob was the one who delighted in books and would become famous later on the other side of the law. Billy would become a fugitive from justice, an adventure seeker. But first, he would abandon his plan of becoming a cowboy. And all it took was one flight in a small plane. How I got interested in flying is I went on a vacation down to Miami to see my first cousins. And Reggie Hamlin, who wound up retiring as air traffic controller, he was going to uh, Miami Day Junior College and taking flying lessons at Burnside Art uh, Aviation. And I had no idea that somebody, normal people, could fly airplanes. I thought that you had to be in the Air Force or at least have a college education before you could do that. We worked out a way to go that I could sneak out and get in the airplane and, and go with it. I was hooked, and I got back home. I told Daddy, I said, look, I'm not going to be a cowboy no more, and he was glad of that. Uh, I'm want to learn to fly. And I can uh, start now. Got my private license at 17. I got my commercial license at 18. That's as young as you can get that. Got my uh, multi engine rating, instrument rating, uh, flight instructor rating, and all that. Just bing, bang, boom. Uh, shortly after, the flying part never was a problem for me. The uh, What held me up more than anything was the written <laughs> test because you know going to be i was going to be a cowboy so there wasn't a lot of, i didn't spend a lot of time on uh book studying and stuff after deciding he would spend his life as a pilot billy deagle realized he would have to find a way to make a living as one and he found that opportunity at his home airport in lake city florida so when i got my flight instructor rating I bought a uh, Cessna 150. Daddy helped me get that. I uh, went to the city and told him I would like to uh, take over the uh, the concessions there, the fuel, the tie down, the hammer rent, and give uh, lessons. While Billy was struggling to make a go of running operations at the airport in Lake City, another local pilot had come under suspicion for flights clandestine in nature. Flights into Columbia. And that's when men with badges and guns showed up at the airport office to ask for Billy's help to entrap his fellow aviator. Billy not only refused their request, he felt it was his duty to warn his friend. So the FBI, the DEA, and uh, customs agent, and the local sheriffs, they came out to the airport and tried to talk me into... uh, going to Tom and offering him my services and my airplane to Aztec to go to Columbia and uh, pick up marijuana. I uh, I turned him down. I, they wanted me to wear a wire and get him to bark a spot on the map, this, that, the other. They told me what a bad guy he was. Well, I'd known him for several years, not real, real close. 
but I didn't think he was a bad guy. Everything they seized from him, they would give me a portion of it and all, which I needed money, yeah, but I wasn't in, uh, in dire straits or anything, but I wasn't going to, I, I, I wound up warning Tom because that's just, well, that's not me to set somebody up. That seems kind of dirty. So I, I warned Tom, and he uh, he told me, he said, well, if you want to do that, uh, let me know. And I said, no, Tom. I said, did you, did you hear me? I said, they are on you, they're on you good. When Billy Deekle turned down his friend's offer, he hadn't yet faced the prospect of losing his business. But then his father's business ended in bankruptcy and Billy and his young family soon faced their own financial crisis. Looking for a way out, he decided to return to the local smuggling pilot and take him up on his offer. So I'm in uh, a pretty bad shape there, behind on the house, they were behind on our, our car. We lost the car. Like I've, I've told people before, I, it got so bad that we were shaking, the, turning the piggy bank upside down to... Uh, go to the grocery store and I said this is not I don't see any way out the only way I see to make get caught up on everything is I'm I can fly as good as any of these guys I know that's doing this and, and so it's time for me to do it I went to Tom and we uh I started smuggling and that uh that cured the uh financial problems but it caused a lot of other problems when I went to Tom and told him that I was ready he said, uh, all right, I, uh, I've got a DC-7 down in uh, Seaburn, Florida. And I said, man, Tom, I, I've never flew anything like a DC-7. He told me, he said, the experience you've got in the airplanes you've flown, he says, there's no, you will not have any problem flying this plane. He said, when, when we get there, all we'll do is hold up. Uh, laid up, mull up, head back. Here we go. Uh, got in there and cranked her up, headed out to uh, the runway. I'm, uh, I'm nervous uh, on one thing, and it's feeling good. Uh, you know, part of me's feeling real good. Hey, I'm flying a big airplane. And then part of me is nervous. It's like, I, you know, I ain't really sure I can do this. I had a catastrophic engine failure. It rocked that whole plane all like an earthquake. She was bucking. Whatever that finally started slowing down, uh, the propeller so winding down real slow. Was, yeah, everything's out of balance. The airplane's going whoop, whoop, back and forth. <laughs> Turn around and went back, and uh, I made a, I made a good landing. So that's the DC-7 story. And we went to a Cessna 210. Went from four engines down to one engine after that. After the near-disastrous flight in the DC-7, Billy had one other aborted trip in a newly acquired Cessna 210 before he could begin his smuggling career. And his first real trip? While it was hardly an auspicious beginning, it was successful, and it taught Billy a very valuable lesson. He discovered that as a smuggler, he would often have a passenger, and that passenger would be fear. And the lesson he learned was that you just have to live with it and keep pushing on. First actual flight that I that I accomplished was in a 210. I uh, took off from Moulter, Georgia, and was head. I went like 110 miles inland Columbia down in the in the valley, uh, where the mountains on the left are, you know, uh, like Venezuela, and the mountains on the right so in Columbia, and down uh, below uh, Vega de Par is. Uh, uh, cow field, cow pasture down there before I landed. Uh, that first trip was a nightmare. I ran into all kind of weather going down, and when I got to uh, going through that valley, going down to that cow pasture uh, down below Bayou du Par, uh, it was daylight. Now, I got to Columbia about uh, uh, to that strip right about dusk and they had a uh, they were burning a tire that was my signal we didn't have no radios or nothing to talk to them 
So I was just looking for smoke. And so when I seen the smoke, I, I came in and landed. And uh, it was, uh, took about 11 hours from Moulter, Georgia to there. And I, uh, I get out. I got a uh, pistol that uh, they wanted me to give the Hefty down there for a present. So the uh, first thing he got, he comes up to me. I can tell he's when I get out of the airplane. I can tell he's the boss man because he's got walking up to me and he uh, he gets up to me, he pounds his chest three or four times, and uh, goes coach hand. And so I pound my chest two or three times back at him, and I go, Billy. And he goes, Gringo Billy. And, and he's called Abby Old Loco. <laughs> so he, uh, and then I, I gave him the gun, the, the pistol. It was like a Western pistol. And he starts shooting it. Uh, cow patties. Bam, bam. He's target practice and shooting piles of cow poop. <laughs> They're loading the airplane, filling the uh, filling it with fuel, and I had took the yoke off of the co-pilot side. The rudder paddles on the uh, co-pilot side. I had stowed them, you know, forward. So we filled that tunnel up with pot, filled all the way up to the ceiling. I can't even see out the right side at all. I'm just looking straight ahead. Everything you could put in that airplane, we put in. It took a long ways to get off the ground, and it was climbed out real slow, and uh, it cut our, cut my air steep down. It took over 12 hours to get back, and I was a little concerned when I first took off about how heavy everything was and slow that uh, my oil tank was going to run hot, but it, it, it didn't. I was lucky there, and I'm coming back. That's already dark thunderstorms all in the valley and uh they actually uh helped uh the lightning did to see the mountains and uh so i'm down there at that time at night time uh at columbia they would turn the vors off and i don't know why they done it i don't know if they still do it but they, the, the VOR at Value Depot was off, and that's what I navigated in on. Coming back out, I just basically flew reciprocal headings from the way I came in and tried to stay. It's a pretty wide valley, so I wasn't going through no or canyon or anything, but they was, you know, the ones stay away from the mountains. And actually, uh, you know, normally when you get over the water, uh, over the ocean, more dangerous uh or less you're on a, a more hostile environment under you but actually the weather felt i got out of the mountains so that was really when i passed over rio hacha i said dan i said boy that's i'm relaxed some because that's i ain't got to worry about the mountains no more i got into i don't know how many pilots have had this happen but the uh I've had it happen several times, and I got into such bad turbulence, extreme, uh, heavy turbulence, that I could not focus. The whole instrument panel was a blur. I could not focus on the, and that made it even harder to keep the right side up. But I found out something on that trip that an airplane is a lot, take a lot more punishment than what you think it will because I, I was thinking the whole time well this is it <laughs> they're they going to be wondering what what happened to me you know they're going to say he, last time we seen him he was heading that way and my family you know I was thinking about uh you know they're going to be they're going to be hard on them wondering you know where am I what happened and uh, then and in the middle of all of that the Dalton airplane started backfire. Well, when it first backfired, I said, I said, well, this is it now for sure. But it kept backfire. It, it would go a while, and it backfire once or twice. It goes more and backfire another few times. And after a while, it, uh, I, was, 
I said, well, it's going to take backfiring and running. That's okay. So uh, as long as it does that, I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep heading on. Man. And he's going to turn around and go back and try and get on land anywhere. And it was, uh, that was really, really, if anything was going to stop me, discourage me, that should have done it. But like I said, it's, I stayed uh, scared for so long on that trip that I tell people I said I burnt, scared out. The things that would normally concern me before were minor after that. Billy would fly 15 or so flights to Columbia before turning his focus on the much closer fields of Jamaica. And it was in Jamaica that he would first be arrested and do time in prison. Yeah, I made made about between 10 and 15 runs to Columbia before I started uh, going to Jamaica. It's it's like the uh, people in the trucking business. You're always trying to cut your haul down. And if you can get as good a product closer, that's what you do. And so we wound up with a uh, Jamaican connection. And uh, I wound up in jail in Jamaica with the connection. Then I wound up getting a better connection and uh, didn't have no problems after that. I'd go back to Columbia, too, uh, on occasions after after I started into Jamaica. If somebody had something they wanted, they had a run ready. I knew a lot of smugglers now from where I was getting my airplane work done at Keystone Heights with Barney Cam, that a lot of smugglers were there using using his uh using him as a mechanic. And I had been using Barney as ever as a mechanic from ever since I had an airplane. You know, legally. I'd be down there and there so hey uh so and so's got a load ready, uh and he don't he don't have a pilot. He's, you know, wants to go, and so he's got Excalibur Queen Air, and I said, well, I'd like to fly that. I never flew one of those, so I'd pick up side jobs. I was hunter hill, basically. And my biggest year, my biggest uh, year as hired help is just a pilot. I did 23 loans and made a $1,300,000. That was a a beautiful year. When we return, you'll hear how Billy Deagle could have turned bad luck into a good decision, but how that wasn't in the cards. For a time, Billy's string of good luck held. But then a co-conspirator was caught somewhere else, and prosecutors offered him a lighter sentence if he provided them with information on others. Well, what happened is we um, got under uh, investigation. Luckily, they couldn't test us, and it wasn't because we were so good. It was just that it, we were lucky. They had what was called the grand statewide grand jury was in panel for drug smuggling. This was back in the late seventies. We were the last people to get indicted last route. I think we had 18 count of racketeer and uh, I had every idea I was, I'm a racketeer. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I thought, you know, that was uh, the mafia. Yeah, we got indicted for that and it, it was, it would never called us and never had no drugs, never had, had nothing. It's the fella that uh, was the co-pilot on the DC-7, he was on the Federal Witness Protection Program got us arrested his uh testimony at the grand jury he gets busted up here doing something and winds up telling on us many people would have reflected on having spent time in a jail in jamaica and then being caught up in a large-scale arrest in florida and made the decision to leave the business of flying drugs into the united states for billy deacon that could have been the moment when his decision would have saved so many people Years of grief. That wasn't the one he made. I never, it never crossed my mind not to go back. It was just something that, uh, to me, that is the most fun 
challenging, free flying you can do. This, I loved it. It's not that Billy was incapable of learning a lesson. Far from it. When people speak of him as a pilot, it's with respect for his skill. Beyond that, he also had the ability to learn and adapt, as when he realized that the way they approached the choice of runways in Columbia and later Belize would serve him just as well here in the States. I almost got caught a few times up here landing at airports, and we go down there and we land on out on that desert at Wahia, uh on the homemade strips in Jamaica and Belize, take off out of there with the load, which is the most, that's the most dangerous part of the whole thing, is taking off that load out of those unimproved strips, which are, ain't really a strip anyway. And then I get up here, and I want to go into the Lake City Airport or Keystone Airport. Or, I said, that don't make no sense. I'll start landing in the cow pastures up here in the dirt roads and pipelines and things like that. Just anywhere, because if I can do it down there, why don't I do it up here? I said, they can't watch all these cow pastures. In addition to pilots, there was one other thing that drug smuggling operations couldn't do without airplanes. They would buy them, rent them, and on occasion, steal them. So when Billy and a local partner nicknamed Doc discovered they could get their hands on a collection of aircraft master keys, keys that would open the doors on a surprisingly wide number of suitable aircraft, they came up with a simple plan to make that happen. Yeah, we would buy airplanes, rent airplanes, and I have... uh, I don't call it stealing them because they got them back. Everyone we ever got, we after we got through with, we just leave it right there where it was at, on on a dirt road, pipeline, or wherever. So they get they get their airplane back, and those keys they would fit ninety percent of the airplanes. One of the keys, you just have to stand there on the ramp and check them. And what we would do during the daytime. We'd fly by and look and see these airports that don't have uh, a lot of security at night, you know, but have um, some airplanes. Ocala, we went down there. They had like about three or four Cessna 210 sitting there, a couple of Aztecs. So I would check the keys and mark the key to the airplane. And we would fly in there at night. We'd go in the daytime and say, oh, there's plenty here. We're coming back tonight to check the keys. So we'd come in at night. We wouldn't be awful late. We'd be after closing, you know, like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Then we'd pull over to the ramp, park the airplane, walk up to the uh, the door to be fa- fixed-based operation, knock on the door. Hey, anybody here? You know, we want some gas. And as long as there's nobody there, you know, if somebody come out, we'd just we'd buy some gas. If not, you know, hey, then if we're here by ourselves, get the keys out, start checking. So I'd go over and uh, jiggle the key, stick the key in until I got the key. But that's how we'd do it. We would uh, check and get, you know, several airplanes spotted out in advance. There is one plane that even so many years later, Billy still wistfully remembers. It's not one he stole, but one he bought. It was well-equipped for smuggling, and he planned for it to be his workhorse on many flights to Central and South America. But on his very first takeoff with a full load on a bad runway, the plane protected him in the crash, but wouldn't survive the brutal disposal method of the suppliers and loaders. I bought a beautiful uh, 210, it was fine. And uh, I said, man, this thing here, I'm going to make a lot of money with this airplane. When when I get to the strip down there, the Pine Ridge, they called it, it was a homemade strip. They had had a, just had a big storm go through. I landed, you know, water going everywhere, turned around, got back there, and we loaded her up. When you're taking off out of those places, if you're going to abort, you're going to have to abort real soon. You know, you're going to take off or crash most of the time. 
I tried to take off, and uh, it's just too much. Every time I'd hit some dry spot and get to picking up some speed, I'd run out of dry spot and start hitting hitting water again, and water just be fanning everywhere, and it slowed me down, and I wound up tearing the airplane up on the uh, at the end of the runway because so when I did abort. Because I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to try. I know I can't get off now, but I don't want to just run out through these trees wide open trying to take off. So I, uh, I, I chopped the power and, and still tore the airplane up, which was, uh, really sad. So I went up to, uh, into Mexico and hung out for about a week and then came back. You know, they're unloading everything because they're not going to leave the pot on it. And uh, when they got back to the house, uh, they were reported in, hey, we burned the plane. And that's, uh, you know, that upset everybody, but it's too late. They're getting upset, don't help nothing. Actually, they burned it, it's burned. With this plane, now a pile of molten aluminum pushed into the brush alongside a distant runway. Billy hits to ride back to Florida and began planning on how to get his marijuana delivery service back in the air. In part two of his story, you'll hear the tragic tale of the day he could not prevent the horrific death of a worker loading his plane and of his time as a fugitive. You'll meet his brother Bob, one of Florida's most well-known and respected prosecutors, and how even when he was prosecuting the most famous serial killer in American history, Bob Deakle had to deal with the news that his younger brother was about to be arrested as a drug smuggler. You'll hear from the North Florida lawman who captured Billy at the point of a gun, an arrest that would end with a life sentence for the smuggler pilot. And you'll meet Billy's wife, Kay, a woman whose remarkable strength and resilience kept their family together for the more than two decades that he spent in prison until the mercy of a presidential clemency returned his freedom. All of that and more coming up in part two of this story. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fly By Night. Fly By Night is brought to you by Midnight Flyer Media. Theme music is Darker by Henrik Anderson, with sound design and original music by Abe Steitz. Show art is by Aini, with additional design by Ave Steitz. The show is produced, hosted, and edited by Charles Steitz. If you like what you hear, please leave a rating and a review, and subscribe to Fly By Night wherever you get your podcasts. And for photos and more on the key players in each episode, visit flybynightpodcast.com.